Enough with the lost. It really should be the parable of the finder shepherd, the loving father, the coin of great value. We often place the emphasis on that which is lost, whereas even in the story of the son who chooses to go away, it is the love of the father that brings him back. The call is not so much to look for the lost, it is to shine a light so that those who think they are lost in the light of the gospel rediscover their value. God is searching for ways to show us we are worth the sacrifice, worth the grace, and worth going back home. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panel today, and I'd like for you to say your name and uh, share with us the greatest gift you've ever received. Hi, Michael. I'm Christy Gonzalez-Vasquez, and I would say the greatest gift I ever received was my family, my mom, dad, my husband, my sister. But if you're actually asking me when I was 18 years old, I'd say my bright, shiny red convertible car. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mike. My name is Rhea Diaz, and the best gift I've ever received um, was the chance to travel with my family um, mm. around the world. So that's that's been a really great experience. Hi, Mike. Uh, my name is David Flores. It's a pretty difficult question for me to answer. I, I if I were to say the, the the best gift I've ever received, I would probably say uh, would be my education. Uh, mm. It's something that I haven't. That is yeah. good. Sorry, Mom. Not, not, not many Sorry, people get, get the opportunity to, to get that, and I, I've been blessed uh, to, to be given that opportunity. Wow. Well, I'm going to go with my kids. They're the, the greatest gift that I have ever received, so I feel like, you know, education's up there, too. <laughs> but, yeah, definitely. In the car. Yeah, the car, of course, and uh, traveling across the world. Right. All great gifts. Um, Christy, would you mind reading our verse and having prayer for us? Sure. Okay, so Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's bow our heads for prayer. And actually, I'm going to pray in Spanish, if you all don't mind. Wonderful. All right. Querido Dios que tan cielo, gracias por este día que nos ha dado aquí hoy para estar todos juntos, para tener la oportunidad para leer la lectura bíblica para estudiar y para aprender más de ti. Querido Dios, te pido que estés con todos nosotros en este momento y con toda la gente que está viendo este show en la televisión. Cuídanos siempre y ayúdanos. En nombre de Jesús. Amén. Amén. So, today, we're talking about the mission of Jesus. Okay? We've kind of been discussing his kingdom, his purpose. Now, today, we're talking about the mission of Jesus. The first question that we want to we want to jump right into is in Christian discourse we hear a lot about salvation. Yeah? Why is this such an important term for Christians? Salvation drives the mission of Christianity. Okay. When you think about it, we want to bring people closer to Christ so that they can be saved. So there you go. Okay. That's important. Anyone else? Why is salvation such an important term? Well, I think there, there is no other way for us to be close with God if we are not saved. I mean, if we continue to, to live the lives that we live full of sin or, or continuing to live with intentions that are not just, salvation is the only thing that can actually provide us the opportunity to change. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it is. And I'd say it's salvation. It's just, we were talking about gifts earlier. I mean, that's the number one gift that we would ever get mm -hmm. is salvation. And the fact that one day we're actually, all of us, we're going to see each other in heaven. So you want to change your answer? Life. I, I do want to change my, <laughs> okay. I need Not a the life big life. red card. <laughs> salvation. Salvation. Yes. Oh yeah. I would change mine as well. <laughs> salvation. Right. 
But it, it is. It is the ultimate gift. And, and like I said, that we'll have eternal life in heaven. I just, that's amazing. Right. And we have to remember that we didn't have to get that. Mm -hmm. We right. didn't do anything to deserve it. Mm -hmm. But we, we, you know, it's a gift. So, so when we say the mission of Jesus, can we say it was salvation? It was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? It was. And so that's why I think it, it, for me at least, why it's such an important term. It kind of defines my existence. You know, I, like you said, we didn't do anything to deserve it. We can't, we can't, we can't really earn it. You can't earn salvation. So it's there. This was something Jesus set forth to do for us. And, and, and in that mission, in salvation as a Christian, we need, to, we need to be working to strive towards what it is that Christ would have us do after offering us that gift, right? Mm -hmm. That brings, it reminds me of Ephesians 2.8, mm -hmm. which says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I absolutely love that text. So I kind of think of salvation is, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. We have to choose to accept that gift, and, and that needs to be enacted upon when? Today, now. Now. Before All it's times. too late. Right. Right? You, know, you, can't, you can't ask for salvation after, you, after you've passed away. You can't, you can't accept the gift of salvation after you, you've died. So while you're living today, while you're here, mm -hmm. salvation is something that, that you need to actively be willing to accept each and every day. I think we take that for granted sometimes because, you know, when you're young mm -hmm. and you're having fun, you're like, let me get it out of my system because right. I've got until I'm 30, well, 35. <laughs> <laughs> I Careful with the date. Yeah, Careful exactly. Careful with the dates. Yeah. When I'm 35 to like get my act together right. and finally start, start my Christian walk. Right. But it shouldn't be that way. And probably everybody has that different benchmark that they say they'll begin, you know, the acceptance of grace. You know, they'll begin living the life that they should be living. And, and that's, that's something we really have to kind of put in front of ourselves and all, kind of help. All you have to do is pull up CNN.com right. on a daily basis. And you think about people your age, people younger, people older, they thought they had tomorrow too. Right. Absolutely. And while we have the chance, we need to get on it. Get on top of things. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, our next question, what does the parable of the lost sheep tell us about God's love for us? It's found in Luke 15, verses 4 through 7, if anyone has it. And we're talking about the parable of the lost sheep. Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 7. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine wrong number, <laughs> righteous persons who do not need to repent. So what does that tell you of the value of just one? I think it's, it's very relatable to something my, my father always told me. My father always told me that uh, Satan doesn't really worry for those who believe in God. I'm sorry, for those who do not believe in God and are living the world you know, with the temptations that are all in it. Satan tries to go for the people who believe in God and are trying to avoid Satan. Mm -hmm. So God is trying to do the opposite of what Satan is trying to do. He's trying to save those that are already in Satan's clutches, trying to save them from the death and just unhappiness that they are going to have in general in life. And he's trying, he's trying to save them from that. He's trying to save them from not being able to have salvation, not being able to join everybody who believes to have eternal happiness. He's trying even to even if them. it's just the one. Even and, if it's just the one. And when we look at, we look at the example of a shepherd, right? All of the sheep belong to the shepherd. Mm -hmm. So why, why um, or, or isn't, instead of a why, isn't it more um, comforting to know that even with all of the riches exemplified through that flock, 
the shepherd would still go after the one. You know, if he had a thousand sheep and lost one, he's got 999 more. But what is the value of that one that is so intensely important that he must go and seek for that one? That is, that's powerful. That means the value of, of ourselves individually holds just as much value collectively. Mm -hmm. And that is, that, that makes you feel, it makes you feel small, yet large. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm such a small portion of this greater body, mm -hmm. but I hold such great importance that, that Christ would come specifically for me. And you think about now there are billions of people on this planet, but think about all the millions or billions that have passed away before us. Mm -hmm. I mean, and Christ cared about them too. Right. Puts a lot of things into perspective. Absolutely. Our next question. Compare the story of the prodigal son with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. How do the two balance each other out? So maybe we can unpack those. So we talk about um, the, the prodigal son. And so what do we know of the prodigal son? The story. He was, uh, there was a father and there were two sons. Mm -hmm. One of the sons decided to receive his inheritance and go off and explore into the world, uh, spend his riches on everything. Uh, he ended up spending all his money to the point where he- Squandering it. Yeah, it was yeah. just gone. And and, he, and specifically living in a life of sin. Right, specifically. exactly. And it, it just got to a point where he, he missed his home. He missed his father. He, he realized that his father was actually trying to help him live a good life. So and what was happening to the other brother? The other brother was with his father the whole time. So you have two, two different lifestyles, basically. The one where he was just spending all that he possibly could as quick as he could, and the other one that stayed faithful with his father. And, and I think it's important we say stayed faithful, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because we, we know where the story starts heading. Right. Go on. Yeah, so the, the son ends up mustering up the courage to uh, return to his father. And his father welcomes him with open arms. Uh, it says in the text that he hugged him, he kissed him, he gave him a new robe, he gave, put a ring on his finger, mm -hmm. asked for the servants to kill their, their fattest calf. And the oldest son was out in the field working uh, when he started hearing music. Mm -hmm. He asked one of the, the servants, what's going on? Right. And that's when the servant told him, oh, well, your brother returned. He, he's, he's finally back. Right. Instead of being happy that his brother returned, he was angry and upset. And he went straight to his father. And he's like, why are you throwing a party for him? He left you. Like, right. he, he spent all the money that you gave him. How come you never threw me a party? Right. And, and so it, it's kind of like, Immediately you know, right there, at that point, we find the level of his faithfulness. We find the level of his... Of his um, of what he understood redemption to be, of what he understood the purpose of, of salvation to be, right there. Right, yeah. I think it's, it's kind of like the, the, the oldest son felt it was his works right. that were gonna Absolutely. let him be on the good side of the father. Like he thought that just by staying at his side, being obedient, mm -hmm. he was gonna be able to right. be clear, but that wasn't And so the then if we go through the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, what do we see there? We see Lazarus, a poor beggar, standing outside the gates of this man, man's home, this man who, you know, was lavish, was rich, probably drove the Range, version, Rave, Range Rover version of a camel. <laughs> right. You know, All rose, the bells and whistles. All the bells and whistles. <laughs> GPS installed, everything. GPS on right. his camel and everything. Right. Right. And um, when... Flash forward when this guy's in hell, not Lazarus, but mm -hmm. the rich guy, and he... And this is in the parable. This is in the parable. Yeah. And you know what? I read the story, and it made a lot of sense mm -hmm. to me, but now I am trying to piece things together. Yeah. But he's actually in, in hell, and he's begging God to give him a second chance. Right. Am I right? Well, really, it, yes, you're on, the, you're, on, you're on that right track. And what happens is, is that L Lazarus ends up in heaven... The rich man right. ends up in hell, mm -hmm. and he's like, why am I here? And he's like, can you reach down and, and, and pull me up? And they're basically like, you know, sorry, you know, there's nothing we can do to help you. 
you had your opportunity to live right, and now this man's being rewarded for how he lived, and you are receiving the consequences for how you lived. And he's like, can you at least warn my family? Can you at least warn the people who I care about so that they don't mm -hmm. suffer the same fate? Mm -hmm. And the response is, they have the prophets. Mm -hmm. Everything they need to know on how they need to live is right there for them. If they don't listen to people who are living, why would they listen to someone who is dead? Right? right. They wanted to, he, wanted, he wanted Lazarus to go back and warn his family. So now when we see the two parables and we link them together, what are we able to draw from the existence of these, uh, well, figuratively speaking in the parable with Lazarus and the rich man, but then speaking figuratively as well with the prodigal son? Well, the prodigal son, I like thinking back to the brother, mm -hmm. you, it could be you sitting in church thinking you're doing everything you need Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. You're vegetarian. Right. You don't watch TV on Sabbath and you're thinking, wow, this is the golden ticket to heaven. Right. Um, versus, you know, a prodigal son who has messed up right. royally through the course of his life or for some time. And, and one, of, one of the key points, I guess, to, to, to bring out here is that the prodigal son had a second chance because he was still alive. Right. Mm -hmm. The rich man doesn't have a second chance because he's already dead. Mm -hmm. And so that brings, that brings us to a, a point of realization that you must do what you're required to do while you're still alive still right living. here, right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And that is, that, is a, that is a strong point that I think they're bringing out here. The next question is, what, if anything, do we contribute to God's saving mission? So if there's anything that we could contribute, what is it? I think the, the one and only thing that we can contribute is just try to, to spread the word as much as we possibly can, mm -hmm. um, if, if, if that is the thing that we can contribute, mm -hmm. because it, it, it's... Like, like, what can we really do to embellish the mission of Christ, <laughs> right? But if there is anything... Yeah, I feel, I feel it's that. I feel it's, it's, it's sharing the word, because once... We can present it to to everyone we possibly can, and 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 Jesus will, God will do the rest. God will work on that person once we present the word. Can we be those ambassadors that present the opportunity to those who are still living, that may not be paying attention, just as the rich man requested Lazarus to do to go back and warn the family? Why wait? Why wait till till they're dead? Can we be those individuals that help bring people to the realization of what it is? that they're facing? I think we can, but we ourselves, we have to look at ourselves first and say, mm -hmm. are we ready to do that? Right. You know, because it's one thing being able to recite a bunch of Bible verses, mm -hmm. you know, Romans 5, 2, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but... Which <you> states? <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it before. Right, the right, right. Um, but honestly, are we ourselves ready to go out and tell other people? You know, it's like almost like, okay, before I talk to somebody else, and this is me personally, it's like putting a mirror right here and saying, okay, am I doing everything right? Am I doing all the things that I'm about to tell this person? You know, we talk a lot about the rules and, and everything that we need to do, but we need to show God's love as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with me at any time that I'm trying to spread God's message, I like to use, you know, my own stories or something that's happened to me, put it into perspective. Mm -hmm. instead of saying, okay, let's dive in, which is, I mean, we need to do. Right, right. We but need there's to like an goal. order of how things should occur. Exactly, right. exactly. Because I'm not going to go to somebody and say I'm, you know, holier than thou when I know I'm not. Right. You know, we're all sinners. Yeah. And it's not because, you know, maybe, you know, it's like you said, we go to church, you know, you're punching in, punching out, you mm -hmm. know, but what else are you doing? You know, we have to reflect first on ourselves. And then after that, I say, you know, we can go out and, and spread the word of God to everybody, but be prepared mm -hmm. first. Right. And I also, my mind just went blank. It happens. <laughs> Romans 5-2. <five two. Yeah. laughs> so, one of the things that I, I wanted to point out is when we mentioned earlier in the lesson to show how the shepherd valued that one sheep, we should value each other that same way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, because we, we, we are responsible for one another in that way. We are. You know, when, when, when Christ was here and he lived his life, he kind of took that responsibility upon himself. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're living a life that reflects the body of Christ, the, the, the embodiment of Christ, we kind of have that responsibility to one another as well. Each one of us are a member of that flock. Right. Each one of us should be willing to seek and help in whatever way that we can mm -hmm. to contribute to God's saving mission. 
Right. And I, I keep thinking just the visual, right? Like rejoicing because you have that one, you know, the, the one sheep mm -hmm. on your on your shoulders. But imagine like an actual person. Right. How amazing would that feel because you brought them to the church or right. you did something for them. I mean, imagine, you know, you've got them right here on your shoulders, feeling that weight that they had and bringing mm -hmm. them to the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's a feeling deserving of coffee and I mean, donuts. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I, well, I think the idea also. Decaf. <laughs> decaf. <laughs> but I think I think the idea of, of trying to make sure that we we help one another also brings uh, a verse that's that's in Proverbs. I, I don't remember the exact location, but it says, "As iron sharpens iron, a man sharpens another man." Right. Mm -hmm. So we are able to correct each other, help each other out. If we seem to, to veer off the course a little bit, mm -hmm. we can help each other get back. Absolutely. Um, our next question is talking about what does the account of the healing of the blind man teach about our utter dependence on God? That story is, is found in Luke 18, verses 35 through 43. If there's a way that we can maybe summarize that, but I at least wanted to give the scriptural reference, Luke 18, 35 through 43. Yeah, sure, please. Okay. It says, Then it happened, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging, and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, and he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Amen. So what does that passage teach us? about our utter, utter dependence upon God? I think if we, if we look at what the text is saying, the way, the way I kind of received it was, we are not able to see clearly if we don't have God in our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we do not depend on God, if we do not have that faith in Jesus, we are not able to, to, to walk faithfully. We are not able to, to see what is ahead of us well. And what reassurance did this blind man have that Jesus would even heal him? I mean, he had heard maybe mm -hmm. that Jesus heals people, but how did he know Jesus was going to stop at that moment and heal him? That he could just call out his name and gain the attention of Jesus Christ. And then, you know, without any specific knowledge of what formula would be used mm -hmm. or what, you know, practices must occur in order to receive that healing, he was healed, right? So there almost seems like there's this complete surrender, mm -hmm. a full faith mm -hmm. that must be implored mm -hmm. when you're approaching the Savior. And especially like, considering yeah. there was the group of people saying, be quiet, right. don't talk, yeah. like you should not be speaking right so now. So there was also some indignant stance that was there as well. Right. Like, you know, you can't hold me back from my blessing. Right. You know what I mean? It's here, it's now, I'm faithful. I. I know that this can occur and, and not letting people shut you out or push you away from, from that blessing. He had bold faith. Bold faith, bold faith, absolutely. What else can we kind of draw from that? I think what we can draw is, I mean, we need to have as much faith as this blind man. Right, absolutely. I mean, he was blind. He couldn't see, I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, you know, sometimes you're like sitting in a very, you know, dark room or, or all of a sudden the light comes on, you know, you're sleeping, you turn on the light, you kind of go like this. I just keep thinking of that moment that he saw Jesus mm. right there for the first time. He had sight. I mean, I, I don't even know what that would feel like, but to know that he had so much faith without even seeing, he just heard. He didn't see, he mm -hmm. didn't see any of these miracles. He just heard and he said, hey, if I have a lot of faith, I know that Jesus can save me like I've heard that he saved others. This is just a very powerful message. And if you paint that scene a little bit more, imagine being blind in a crowd mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's kind of like you're kind of in a stupor, mm -hmm. kind of just sitting there, you're blind, you don't really know what's going on, you know, mm -hmm. there's lots of people coming by and you hear that Jesus is coming through. Mm 
-hmm. Can you imagine that emotion that comes through? Like, what? I, healing is, 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 is possibly on its way. Mm -hmm. And you're hearing people telling you to be quiet. He doesn't have time for you. He's not going to pay attention to you. Mm -hmm. what, what comes to mind as you kind of try to relive that experience or kind of imagine that experience? I'm here thinking, you're not stopping me. Right? I'm going to get my blessing right now. And you all can move out of my way because I'm getting the blessing. But what about that? What about faith. that sense of desperation that comes up? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think there's a, a, a lot of anxiety. Right. Like, I think yeah. he would have been anxious. Like, you know, where where is he? Where can I find him? Or you maybe know? maybe maybe I do need to be quiet. Maybe he maybe he will. But no 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 no. I, I'm still gonna call out that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine ever being conflicted as to whether or not you should, you know? approach someone about something or, you know, ask for the raise or, you know, you're just like, oh, I should do it. I deserve it. No, I shouldn't do it. Blah, blah, blah. You know, there's that thing that happens. And imagine it being something so detrimental to your, your, your life status. Right. And then that being right there available to you. And then it being fulfilled. That experience is, is kind of like what we're all going through in our Christian walk. And we, we may not recognize what that looks like if we're not really paying attention to that struggle. Mm -hmm. But all throughout our lives, we're going to be having this pull and tug, what we know we should be after, what the world is telling us not to go after, how we cry out for help, who's telling us to be quiet, but, but still determining to have an indignant stance that we know Christ is near. Mm -hmm. He's already offered us the gift of salvation. We just got to call out and accept it. That's major. And we have so many distractions nowadays mm -hmm. to distract us from having that full connection with Christ. We've got all sorts of social media. We've got kids that are connected to the iPad. I mean, I know that I almost feel like my iPhone is a part of me, mm -hmm. like an extension of my arm. Right, right, right. And so <laughs> right now I feel so lost without it. Right. But we, it, it's so easy, easy to disconnect from Christ. Right. Um, in the sense of disconnecting mentally. Right. As we wrap up, in what concrete ways are we to respond against the allurements of the world to the mission of Jesus that he came to seek and save us? And we kind of started to answer that. But what are some of the concrete ways we can respond? So maybe one is to disconnect. Maybe get a little disconnected from... Spending... Yeah. I, I've, try, I've made it a mission. I'm trying that when I wake up in the morning... Mm -hmm first 10, 15 minutes should be devoted right. to reading the Bible and praying and right. asking God to be present in my day. Right. And, that, and I think as long as we stay focused on some of those things uh, and, and we continue to create ways to stay focused, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a better opportunity at recognizing when Jesus is manifesting himself to us. Thank you guys so much for joining us and talking about the mission of Jesus. If you would like to contact us, please visit our website at www.sabbathschoolu.org. That's www.sabbathschool, the letter U, dot org. Remember, the goal of Bible study is information and transformation. It's for the head and for the heart. For Sabbath School U, I'm Michael Martell. <laughs>